Okay, before we talk about cross-validation, I want to briefly talk about hyperparameters. You probably all know what hyperparameters are, so in this case it may be a little bit trivial, but if not, this will be a good uh, recap or refresher on the term hyperparameters. So what are hyperparameters? You can think of them as yeah, the settings or tuning parameters of your model or algorithm. So you can think of it as the tuning parameters, something you tune manually, or maybe a better word would be settings of your algorithm. Or you can also call them options, options that you choose. So to illustrate this a little bit better, let's take a look at our old friend, the k-nearest neighbor classifier. So the k-nearest neighbor classifier, by the way, is a non-parametric model. So we talked about the difference between parametric and non-parametric models before, but just to recap, uh, non-parametric models are models where we don't define the structure of the model a priori, but it depends on the training set. So what I mean by that is consider a case where we have uh, have a fixed size of features, so we are not changing the features, we are just considering uh, certain features. But then if I change the data set, if I have more or less training examples, it will kind of uh, change the structure of the model. So in the case of k nearest neighbors, the parameters of the model are really the training examples. So if I have different training examples, the model will be very different in that way. Or uh, consider decision trees, it's maybe more intuitive to talk about non-parametric models in terms of decision trees. So in decision trees, um, the number of splits really depends on the training examples. We don't specify the structure of the tree beforehand. So we are not just, so you could consider a scenario where we define the structure of the tree and we say uh, which feature we use to split. So x1 greater uh, or equal to some value then x2 and maybe x1 again. So we can have a case like that where we uh, define the tree beforehand and then we could think of the learning process as learning just the threshold here, for example. However, we don't do that really. We uh, let the tree grow based on the training data. So in that way, you can think of it as a non-parametric model because we don't define really the structure of the tree. We let the data define the structure of the model. So in this case, a long story short, the hyperparameters of our k-nearest neighbor algorithm, these are the options for the number of neighbors, for example, k. Another one would be, for example, the distance metric. For example, um, when we have the Manhattan distance or Euclidean distance or some other distance, this would be another option that we have to choose as a practitioner, right? Because um, the number of neighbors, this is not something the k-nearest neighbor model learns from the data. You have to set this option before you run it. So later in this course, we will look at uh, some technique, techniques like grid search or randomized search that help us with the tuning, but ultimately it's just trying out these different values. It's not something um, that you fit to the data. So the number of neighbors is not, nothing you really fit to the data or learn from the data. It's something you really have to try out in practice. So here are some more examples. I just copied these uh, definitions from scikit-learn. So these are just, uh, when you initialize a decision tree classifier, these are just the options. So another case for hyperparameters would be, for example, um, the impurity measure, which was, for example, guinea or the entropy, or the depth of the tree for pre-pruning, the minimum number of um, samples per leaf, and so forth. So these would be all hyperparameters. Uh, I would say something like the random um, state or random seed, that wouldn't be a hyperparameter because that's something you shouldn't really toy around with because if you would just change the random seed and see which random seed performs better, that would be kind of cheating. So that's something you shouldn't tune. So this is not a hyperparameter. This is something you should just set to some value and not really play around with um, for improving the model. Well, another example would be here the gradient boosting classifier. Here, for example, a hyperparameter would be the learning rate. And also something like here the verbosity um, that would not be um, a hyperparameter, so not a hyperparameter, just to be clear about that. Because the verbosity, so this verbose term, this is just um, determining how much information you see when you run the fitting, for example. If you set it to one or two or three, it will just show you more information when you fit the model. Um, but this is really not 
changing the model, it's just showing you more information. So that's an option you can choose, but it's not a hyperparameter. So in other words, not all options are hyperparameters, but all hyperparameters are options. Yeah, just to maybe also show you an example of a parametric model. Uh, here's a uh, drawing of logistic regression. That's something we cover in more detail in Statistics 453 because it's a great introduction to um, machine uh, deep learning, not machine learning. It's a machine learning classic machine learning model or even statistics model. But yeah, it's a great introduction to deep learning because you can think of it as a single layer neural network. Um, so here in this class, we don't cover it in much detail because it takes one, two lectures when we talk then about gradient descent and things like that. And we will cover that in five, five, uh, 453, so I don't want to make it too boring for those students who already took five, four, uh, 453 and for those students who are planning to take 453, I don't want to yeah, um, take away from that because then it would be yeah, too much uh, redundancy. And there are anyways too many other topics we want to cover in this class anyways, all uh, very important lectures on model evaluation that I think will be very useful in practice. And you can always learn about more machine learning uh, algorithms later on once you have a good understanding of how you can, for example, compare machine learning algorithms. In any case, so how the logistic regression model works is very similar to linear regression. So we have the inputs, these are our features. Uh, the one here is this just uh, one particular way of incorporating the bias or so the intercept term. Uh, you can think of it as just another feature here. And then we have the model weights. So the model weights are um, the weights that we determine based on the number of features. So it's a, that's basically the structure of the model. It's um, defined a priori. And then once we have initialized these weights, for example, to all zeros or small random values, what we then do is we update these weights by uh, in order to minimize the loss, the loss function. For example, in linear regression, that would be the sum squared error or mean squared error that we minimize. So, um, and yeah, uh, just briefly, so how that works, or what we do is we multiply each pair here, each input weight pair, and then we sum them up and we get a single number, the net, so called net input, or it's just a scalar value, it's just a single number. And then in the case of logistic regression, we give it to a nonlinear function. That's a sigmoidal function, a logistic function. It will squish this net input, which can have, uh, it's from minus infinity to positive infinity. We squish it into the range between zero and one. By the way, you don't have to know that for the exam or something, I'm just briefly going over this. And then um, based on that, we can interpret this as a class membership probability for predicting class one or for class able one if we have a binary classification case. And then we can compute how far it is off from the true class label, which is either a zero and one. So this is a value between zero and one. So it's actually never zero and never one. So, but uh, yeah, it's a value between zero and one. And the true label is either a zero and one. And then we compare how close we are to the true, true, lab, true label. And then we compute a cost or loss function, uh, loss on that. And then based on the loss, we update the weights in order to minimize the loss. We can, for example, use different optimization algorithms, like a simple one would be gradient descent or Newton conjugate gradient methods and so forth. There are many different optimization algorithms for that. Um, but the bottom line is here that these Ws are weight parameters. These are parameters, regular parameters, not hyperparameters, because this is something that we learn from the training data. So the model learns to update these parameters. A hyperparameter would be, for example, the regularization strength. I'm not sure if you are familiar with a lasso or rich regression. This concept is here very similar. So in linear regression, we call it a lasso or rich regression. In logistic regression, we usually refer to it as L1 or L2 norms or L1 and L2 penalties, which are essentially the same as uh, lasso and rich in linear regression contexts. So what we do is we add a, a penalty against complexity. So if we have uh, the loss, let's say the logistic loss or cost, what we do is we add this um, penalty. Let's call this just penalty. And this penalty is computed as a lambda times um, the size of the weight. So here this would be the L2 norm. So that would be for L2 regularization. And 
this one depends, this term depends on the size of the weights. So that's nothing we change. However, we as the user, we have to define the regularization strength. So the lambda term here, it's a value you can choose. You can set it to a very small number, for example, 0, 0, 001, or stronger, or larger number, like 0.1 or 1. So it kind of um, inf uh, changes the influence of the size of the weights when we compute the loss. So if you make this value larger, if you set lambda to 1, um, then this, this whole term will be larger. And then the model will try to make the weights smaller um, it's a constraint optimization problem given uh, it will optimize the prediction uh, performance uh, accuracy but then at the same time it will also try to keep the weights smaller that's also one way for example to address overfitting um, in any case um, so the lambda here the bottom line I don't want to go into too much detail explaining now logistic regression because um, that would easily if I want to do it properly take maybe an hour or something <laughs> but so here the bottom line is the difference between model parameters like these w's so these are the model parameters and the lambda here is a hyperparameter so just that you have seen the difference between model parameters and hyperparameters and this is a parametric model because we define the structure of the model up front before we fit the parameters so here we have the w's and we fit the w's so in, in the case of decision trees, we don't have weight parameters. We just grow the tree based on the data. So in that case, the structure of the tree depends on the data. So we call it non-parametric model. But yeah, I wouldn't get um, too hung up on the terms non-parametric and parametric. It's like some jargon we use in statistics and machine learning. But um, yeah, don't. Uh, I would say don't worry about it too much. It's just something you may encounter in practice so you know approximately what the difference is between the two. Okay, how can we now tune these hyperparameters? One technique we already saw last week was the three-way holdout method. So this was a technique where we took a data set and split it into three parts, a training set, a validation set, and a test set. So then we used the training set to fit different models. So for each model, we had a different hyperparameter setting. So for example, uh, in k nearest neighbors, we could set k equals 1. That's usually never a good idea, but let's say k equals 3, k equals 5, and k equals 7. So we get then different models. For each hyperparameter setting, we get a different model. So we have, for example, here three models. And then we would um, yeah, compare the performance of the models using the validation set. So for each model, we use the validation set to compute the performance. So we get three performance measures here, and then we compare them, we can rank them. So which one, for example, gives us the highest classification accuracy on the validation set. And the reason why we use the validation set and not the training set is because, as we learned, we can overfit to the training set. So the validation set gives us a rough estimate of the generalization performance of that model. And then we can choose the best model uh, here based on the validation set performance. And like we talked about last time, optionally we can then combine the data set the training and validation set and we know for example based on this step here what the best hyperparameter setting is let's say we find that k equals 5 is the best setting then we can fit a new model on this combined data set let's say with k equals 5 now and then uh, we can evaluate that model on the test data set um, so yeah and we can then after that, even fit the model on the whole data set. However, we wouldn't know how well this model performs. Usually in practice, the model can only, or is expected to perform better compared to the model that was only fit on the smaller data set. Because if you recall, when we looked at the learning curves, we saw that uh, for the training performance, it usually goes a little bit down, but usually the test set performance with larger training set sizes usually goes up. So if this is the training, let me use a different color so it's not confusing, um, training set size. Here on the x-axis. And then this would be our test performance. Usually um, we can expect that the test set performance becomes better um, because the model will overfit less so this step can actually be, be beneficial but it's optional you don't have to do it you could actually stop 
right here at stop, uh, step five and just uh, use this model for which you exactly know the performance based on the test set. So you estimate the generalization performance on a test set and depending on how large your uh, test set is, is more or less reliable. But yeah, that would be uh, a good stopping point here. Optionally, you can fit it onto this whole data set. This would be one way you can then tune the hyperparameters. So here, the hyperparameter tuning step would be the step, step two and three, when you do the model selection. So that's what we talked about also in last week's lecture. Yeah, the last uh, thing to recap for this video is um, this overview slide of the three different reasons why we care about model evaluation. So we talked about this also in more detail last lecture, but it's been a week. So uh, I want to briefly recap this before we move on to doing cross validation for model evaluation. So the first uh, motivation we talked about was that we want to estimate the generalization performance of a model. So we want to know how well it performs on new unseen data. Uh, the other one was that usually upfront, we don't know what the best model is, right? So we want to actually um, tweak the learning algorithm and select the best performing model. That's essentially hyper parameter tuning and model selection. So steps two and three on the previous slide. And another reason we care about um, evaluation is that we want to identify a machine learning algorithm that is best suited for a given problem. So like I talked about with this email uh, program development um, project, we would probably want to know which is a good algorithm to ship with the email program that can be then learning from the user behavior. Okay, so yeah, there are three uh, main points where we care about evaluation. One is uh, the model performance on unseen data. Then is the second is just also comparing different models to each other. And the third one is comparing different algorithms to each other. So the next, um, in the next video, we will first talk about cross-validation for model evaluation. That would be then targeting point one. So just estimating the generalization performance of a model. And then I will show you some code examples. And then in uh, video five, we will talk about cross-validation for model selection. Oops which would be the second point. So model selection is the one where we rank and compare different models to each other. And this part here will be covered in next week's lecture. So you can ignore it for now. I just wanted to show you yeah, the context here. Okay, so now let's talk about cross-validation for um, model evaluation in the next video.